Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Smart Talks by the Elizabeth Smart Foundation. I am Elizabeth, and I'm here with my co-host, Mio Strong, and I'm going to turn the time to her today to introduce our very special guest. Welcome, everybody, to Smart Talks. Thank you for joining us. I am so pumped about today's podcast for many, many reasons. Um, we are joined by Nancy Hogshead Maycar. She is a multiple-time gold medal Olympian. She is an all-around incredible um, advocate for women in sports. She's an attorney, and we are just so um, excited to welcome her to the show today. She's going to touch on a lot of things, um, some current issues with Title IX, as well as her own journey. And of course, as an athlete, I am just tickled to have you here to speak to you about your own um, journey in athletics and what led you down this path. Um, do you mind just going over your resume just a minute, just to let our audience yeah. know what an awesome um, woman you are. Oh, aren't you sweet? Um, okay, um, so um, usually people wanna know three things about me. Number one is uh, I'm an Olympic champion from the 1984 Olympics. Um, I was a swimmer. Um, two is I'm a civil rights lawyer and I mostly focus on issues dealing with women and sports. And I started uh, about five years ago, an organization called Champion Women, and we provide um, legal advocacy for girls and women in sports. So sexual abuse and sexual violence is certainly one of those issues that we focus on, whether it's in school settings or whether it's in the Olympic movement in club sports settings. So um, yeah, that's the basics. I love it. We recently had a, um, an MMA champion on and she's in the middle of, an, of a lawsuit with her former coach uh -huh. from her um, school, not her current coach, of course. But um, so I'm, I'm very interested to hear kind of the ins and outs of how that works. Um, but first, do you mind just um, taking us down your personal experience? Uh, you yourself have had great coaches. Um, yeah. However, you did take a year off. And do you mind touching on that a little bit? Sure, sure. So um, just a real quick, uh, you know, uh, intro. So I started swimming when I was seven. My parents bought a boat and they just wanted to make sure that me and my siblings were drown proof. They had no great aspirations for any of us. Mm -hmm. um, but they, um, but I got a great coach who is Eddie Reese. Eddie Reese, if you know anything about swimming, he's been the head coach at University of Texas for, you know, 30 some odd years. And he is now the winningest coach ever in the whole United States. So at the time he was probably 22, 24, something like that. And I was seven years old. And um, so what he was good at was sort of imparting the sense of the water and being able to get the feel for it. Um, I, when I, we were 11, I moved to Jacksonville, Florida, and that's when I got my first taste of what a real team was about, a real world-class program. Um, and I started really training hard when I was about 11, 12 years old. By the time I was 12, I was number one in, uh, the country for 12 year olds. Uh, I made it to our senior nationals. You look at pictures of me and I'm like this little gangly kid. I, I kind of can't believe it having 12 year olds now. Um, by the time I was 14, I was number one in the world for all women, um, held the American record. And then um, I made the 1980 Olympic team. But if you don't remember, we boycotted those Olympics. So I have a lot of empathy for these current athletes that are having mm -hmm. to wait a year, maybe longer. But um, yeah, we boycotted those Olympics. We didn't get to go at all. I went off to college thinking that like kind of my better days of, of swimming were behind me just because it, swimming in the hard part of training, it's about, you know, four or five, six hours a day of training. About four of that is in the water. Um, it, it's 400 laps in the morning, 400 laps at night. If I ask an audience, like, what do you, how many laps do you think you've got to be to do the, be the best in the world? They usually say around 50. I'm like, oh. 50? Like, that's not even warm up. <laughs> so, um, oh so... Yeah, so then, um, so my sophomore year in college, um, I was just out for a regular old run. Duke University has two campuses, east and west, and it's just a very popular run where everybody runs. Um, it was the first day of Thanksgiving break. I was in town because it was um, 
because uh, I was training. So I wasn't going to go home. And so nobody else was there suddenly. So I was out for this run and this great big guy comes. And I have to tell you, every alarm bell was going off. And I actually started running into the street instead of the sidewalk. But, um, you know, I just thought, come on, you're at Duke University. You're, this is a normal run. And, you know, don't, you know, so I was trying, telling myself to be quiet. And uh, so he lunged and grabbed me and kind of swung me around. I really could have used uh, your, your uh, self-defense class at that point. We fought really hard. There are three giant evergreen trees. When I tell anybody who's been there, like they know right where it is. And so we fought underneath the brush and un like inside there. So then it's like people couldn't see if they were coming and going. And, um, you know, um, if you look at pictures of me from the time, um, I'm, I'm unusually strong for a woman. I'm, I'm, I'm on the bell shaped curve, like, whoop, there's Nancy Hogshead makeup right over there. <laughs> right. And for most of my life, like when I would like if we're wearing a sleeveless something and I'd reach across the table, uh, to get the salt, I could see the other person on the other side of the table go like this. <laughs> right, because there's so many striations and you know serious muscle. Most most women, most Caucasian women in particular, cannot put on muscle, and I can or I do. And um, so when I tell you that we fought, I mean, baby, we fought hard, and I lost. And uh, he so he pulled me deeper into the woods, and we were um, probably the whole thing lasted about two and a half hours. Um, we were, there was a lot of conversation. There was a lot of talking. I had heard from 17 magazine that you were supposed to, if you got yourself in a situation like that, to have them see you as a person. So I told him how much my mother loved me. And I told him, um, actually I told him I was pregnant. Um, I told them, I told him, uh, um, um, you know, stories that I could think of. Uh, I told him that I was a swimmer. I told him that, um, you know, I really, had, uh, that I had wanted to go to the 1980 Olympics, but didn't get to go. Um, and, um, you know, it, it all kind of like washed over him, I would say. Um, so he didn't really respond. It didn't phase him. Yeah. And he kept switching back and forth between like, I'm going to kill you to on the other hand, like this is a date. Right. And then oh, he would goodness. switch into like, um, like, um, you, you wouldn't be interested in me. He was mad. The fact that I wouldn't have been interested in him, uh, it, you know, except he, him, um, having to rape me. Right. That I, and, and, you know, he, right, was, and he thought that would make you change your mind. That would make you be interested in him. I mean, was he acting like this was going to be like, a long -term yeah, you know, you know, you hear about these. Yeah, you hear about these guys like incels, like who are mad that women just aren't having sex with them. It was like that, but this is you know 1981, right? So long before the concept of incel. But he was just mad that, you know, he was African American. He was probably poor. He um, um, was <laughs> was probably not somebody that I was date would not be in my social circle. Um, and he was mad about that. And, um, yeah, this was, uh, um, him reaching out or, you know, sort of lashing out. Um, at some point, uh, it was a really cold night and, um, have you ever passed out anybody? Have you ever yeah. passed out? Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, when you pass out from whatever reason, like, you know, how you, like the world goes mm -hmm. like that, right. That started happening. And I thought for sure, like, Nancy, you cannot pass out because as soon as you do, you're going to be dead. Like you, you and, and he was talking about like my car's over here and I'm going to come and get you. And, um, and so I wanted to, <laughs> I, I want to make sure that, um, you know, I, um, that I didn't want to go to the next phase. Location. Like I didn't want to go on a car. He, he was talking about, we'll go to a hotel and you can be warm there. I did not want to go to someplace else. Like I wanted us to, finish and get out of there. And um, anyway, so when the, when I thought I was going to pass out, um, I started to cry because that's when I had given up pretty much thinking like, 
what else am I going to do to get out of here? I fought as hard as I could. I have been talking with this guy. I've been doing everything I can, but it's just, you're not going to get out of here. And um, like I was thinking about my mom and I was just thinking about um, dying. And as soon as I started to cry, I could tell that he liked it. And so I started crying harder and, um, and I, within a couple of minutes, he was gone. Um, and the last thing he said when he left was, um, you know, I really respect you. Now, for a long time, I didn't, I, I didn't grasp on to that. I didn't, um, I, I thought like, you know, what a freako that he would tell me that at the very end. But as I've gotten older, I'm 58 now, I, I like kind of need to pat myself on the back that, um, that I did get out of there alive, that I did get this guy to leave me, that I didn't have to, right, go anyway. So it's a, it's a weird thing how the arc of the story and how you, how I have come to think about it has changed over the years. Um, Do you have any insight on, I mean, on why he said that? Do you think he just said, I really respect you because he respected the fact that you survived or... I mean, what, I just can't fathom why anyone would say that to a victim that they've just raped. That they had just raped repeatedly everything that you could, all the nasty things that you can imagine, right? Yeah, yeah I, um, I think it was, um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, like I've just had this recent um, sort of, you know, rethinking of, of this, but um, I told him, I said, don't do this to anybody else. Um, and he said, oh, I won't. Um, and and I didn't believe him. I don't think it was the first time he had done it. He was a little too practiced in how it was that he was able to fight with me and then get me alone. Um, he was never caught. Um, but, um, and, and I have to say, not for lack of effort. Um, but just keeping to the part of the story, like where we left off is... Um, you know, I, I, I was able to tell him this was rape, that this was awful. I didn't let him keep this fiction that this was he and I having a little fun is how he would try to say it. Um, and, um, you know, that, I, that I did, right. I, I, I mean, in the, the police, pretty much everybody says like, you're really lucky to be alive. Um, so, but, but I went directly from there to, he kept talking about where his car was. So I wanted a car that was coming from the other direction. So I I kept like running back into the woods when a car from one direction would come and then I'd come back out and I couldn't find all my clothes. So I was like half naked and what the shirt that I was wearing was torn. Anyway, so I finally get to a car and, um, this poor guy, I feel like I need to like go and complete with him because, you know, like I get in the car and I was crying at this point and I was screaming and like, I'm going to choke up right now telling you the story, but you know, like, like I was like, Oh my God, that just happened. I just, right. So he took me directly to the police station and he was every bit as freaked out as I was. Like, I remember him like shaking, telling the police officers like where he found me and so they could go back and like find my clothes, but also like what, you know, the crime scene where it happened and whatnot. Um, and I have to say, you have to, I have to thank the feminists that went before me because the police could not have been nicer. They were kind and loving and supportive. And um, if I had been raped in um, a lot of countries throughout the world, I would have had to marry that guy. If I had been raped uh, even 20 years ago, I'm not so sure that they that, you know, they would have believed me. Um, I remember like walking into the police station and, you know, here I was an Olympian. I was a Duke student. I was an excellent student. And, um, and there was a part of me that said like, you better buck up Nancy because they, you know, you want them to believe you. Like, why wouldn't they have believed me? Right. But still that was what I was thinking when I was walking into the police station was like, you better get it together and you better bring your A game here. You better. And, um, but, you know, like I didn't frankly need that because they were, I, they were so kind to me. Um, 
you know, I, I one of the things that now in my practice, um, you know, I represent a lot of rape victims. That's so rare that yeah. people are treated with kindness. Um, you know, Duke University had to, okay, so that so then I go to the, to the, from the police to the hospital. And uh, the, the one thing, if I could take anything back of the whole experience from start to finish, the thing that I would take back is um, I gave myself a talking to when I was on the end of the, of the examining table. I just finished the exam. I had already downloaded and told the police what had happened. I told the doctor what had happened. I told the nurses what had happened, right? I, I kind of went through the whole story with all of them. And I had this talking to myself and I said, Nancy, you are not going to let this get you down. You are an Olympian. You are a great student. You are going to have a great life and you are going to go on and you are going to, this is, you're going to pretend like this never happened. This is not going to, okay. If I could take one thing back, it would be that because I think that was like just as you know you might as well just have taken a knife to me I mean that was because okay so then I, I afterwards I got a great case of what we now would say is PTSD so nobody really knew that at the time nobody right the whole term you know what happens to the brain when there's like these high incredible levels of, of uh, adrenaline going through um, so as I was having PTSD, then I would like get mad at myself for having PTSD. And then like, well, why can't you control it? Well, why can't you, um, you know, just sleep at night? <laughs> you know, why can't you? Um, I was having what's called interruptive thoughts, which means you know, like I'd be just in a classroom and I would imagine that like people were going to come with machine guns and say, we want Nancy and really crazy thoughts. And like, well, why can't I stop that? Um, um, I would do. I was doing this crazy thing at my in my dorm room, where um, I would lock the doors, and then I would lock the windows. And I knew the door was locked. I knew the windows were locked. But like, I would kept like just checking, and like you, know, you could look through the light, and you could see whether or not the deadbolt was there in between. It just oh, checking, right? And I would kind of lie to myself, like, ah, eh, just checking, and. Uh, and I've kept doing it over and over again. Um, and so not only was I doing that, but I was also making myself, uh, shaming myself for doing that. And because I was, I knew what I was doing wasn't normal. And um, I, um, I didn't want to tell anybody. So I kind of got cut off from the people who most could help me with something like that. I, you know, I was too ashamed to say like, you know, I'm checking the door 20 times at night. You know, I would like get up in the middle of the night and I'm like, I'm not sleeping. Um, right. I, so again, if I could have done anything different, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard, I hear a lot of stories about women who don't want to go to the police or they don't want to tell anybody because they think that if they just shut up about it, that it, they won't be so emotionally upset. And my ex experience is it works just the opposite, that if you t tell somebody and talk to them, and if you do report or whatnot, that, it, that that helps with feeling better. And to have all, I, I didn't just have shame about having been raped and having somebody violate me. It wasn't just that. It was um, all of the emotional upset that I, that, as much as you can tell, as I could tell myself, you know, you're safe, you're, you know, you're in a protected environment, you're, as much as I could tell myself that it like wasn't getting through. I, I just, I had PTSD. So. And that is then what triggered your break for your year long break from swimming. Yeah. And this, this, oh, I was just going to say, I mean, how long did, um, I mean, it, well, you know, a lot of victims struggle with PTSD their whole lives. Right. I mean, right. did it continue after that year or were you able to get help during that year? Or how long was it right. before you started to find healthy ways of, well, of helping, of healing? Of healing, right, right, right. Okay, all right, ready? <laughs> ready. So this is where, um, I, like, 
uh, you know, every rape victim should get what I got. What I, well, I couldn't really share what was going on, but the right people kind of figured it out that, I, boy, she's in trouble. She really needs help, right? So as much mm-hmm. as I thought I was being very cool and I, you know, um, again, uh, the right people figured it out. There's a guy, uh, there were two people at Duke University who like moved heaven and earth for me. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> One is, um, like, this is the part that always, like, makes me cry, is not the rape part. It's the kindness that I got afterwards that I think, I always think, like, what would happen if I didn't get that? You know, what, how, what would my life have been like if, I, if people hadn't been kind to me? And I have to tell you, most of my clients don't get that. So, so um, I dropped two classes like this, and I didn't have to pay anything, Right. Um, I redshirted my year. A lot of my my clients, the school will tell them <clears throat> you lose your scholarship if you if you don't still yeah if you don't still compete or still uh, swim or whatever their sport is. Um, <clears throat> so I got to redshirt. Um, they moved me from uh, they moved me onto like the most desirable part of campus because it's like the central part because I needed to be around people, and um, right so I got that. Um, and but here's here's an example of like loving care is um, um, so I, I was there there are two parking places one was really close to where my dorm was my room and I could get there lickety split another one was what we call Guam so it was far away and um, at night if I needed to park I just couldn't walk through Guam and I would kind of lie to myself like eh, I'm gonna be lazy I'm gonna whatever but I would park illegally in this really close parking lot so I had a ton of tickets. So I would, so finally, after several months, I went to Duke and I, um, I said, you know, I'm ready to pay these tickets. And instead of just saying like, that'll be whatever, $300, they said, why are you getting all these tickets? And I said, look, I just can't park where I'm supposed to park. And they said, we're going to forgive the tickets and we're going to give you a special parking pass. So you get to park pretty much wherever you want to on campus. I got to park like where the religious leaders parked. I got to park where, yeah, I couldn't park like where the ambulances went, but pretty much other than that, I could park anywhere, right? That's what I mean by what it takes to kind of keep somebody in school, to keep their life on track, to keep them moving forward and trajectory, you know, they're to keep them in school and, you know, to the best that they're able to focus to be able to do that. Um, I, I, um, so right after I was raped, um, I was, I still had about a month or so of school left and I got into two car accidents, one right after the other. Okay. I've never been in one before. I've never been in one afterwards. Right. But it's just an indication that things are not going so well. Um, and so, so, um, after the second one, I just, they, my, my parents said, you know, just get a plane ticket and just get home. Just come home immediately. Like, don't pack, don't anything, just get home. And, um, you know, my, my parents are from Iowa. My whole family's from Iowa. And if you anybody knows anybody from Iowa, they're very frugal, okay? My dad is an orthopedic surgeon. And the thought of getting on a plane without having bought the ticket, you know, four months in advance is like that, that is as like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs as they come. And uh, anyway, so I got home and uh, so I didn't end up taking those exams until like later in the spring. Right. So there almost is no department at Duke university that didn't have to bust it for me. Okay really we we just expect too much from victims that they're able to uh just go on that they're able to you know keep up with classes and not miss a student loan payment and not um not need a lot of intervention not need a lot of help i really needed a lot of help and i i got it sue waslick and and um dean wilson uh those two really made it happen for me and kind of kept my whole life on track so because i was able to not swim for a year my guy i come back to school to duke and my junior year and he goes okay if this guy's really really very devious because he says um he said you're gonna win gold medals in 1984 and i was thinking like right 
I was thinking, you know, that ship has sailed and I have not been swimming for a year. And, and, and he said, Nancy, if you want to keep your scholarship, he just wanted to keep me in swimming. He goes, just show up at the, at the pool. You guys are really good listeners, by the way. I'm telling a good story because you guys are <laughs> listening so well. Anyway, so 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 I, I go to show up at the at swim practices and um and like it just because it was such a slow process, like all I I, I wasn't even um in good enough shape to be able to do a true warm up. Where right? I was talking about those 50 laps, like that's not warm. I wasn't even good enough shape to be able to do that, but I still won. And I was still able to kind of connect with that God spirit of what swimming meant to me. And that sense of, um, you know, anytime that anybody's good at anything that when they can feel that infusion of being blessed, um, that it, um, like I felt it again, you know, and I felt like this is where I'm meant to be. And, um, and so I saw that I, I, you know, I, I sort of created for myself this opportunity to be able to go to the 1984 Olympics. But to do that, I mean, I had to leave college because Duke University at that time anyway, not now, but at that time was not really set up for an Olympic athlete for that mm -hmm. kind of training. And frankly, I wasn't a good enough student that I could have gotten the grades I wanted and trained that hard. For me, it was kind of one or the other. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that, uh, so then I started training. Um, so I left school and, and went to go train. And, and so when you were talking earlier about like some people have PTSD their whole lives, I think one of the things that helped me the most is number one is we know that hard, hard, hard physical exercise helps calm the brain down. Um, number one. And then two is um, when I was under the water, I could scream and it was socially acceptable. Nobody could hear me scream. Nobody could see me. So that it, like, it was a place that I could really get it out. Um, and, and so, and over time I learned that if I got really, really mad, that it was a source of energy and it helped me swim faster. So I learned how to kind of get hold of that, of that fear and that and turn it into anger and how I could fight my rapist in the woods again. And I remember like right after I was raped, the, my therapist saying something like, you know, why aren't you mad at him? Or why don't you want, and I was still so scared of him. I was like, look, I want to get out of there. I want to, you know, where's the exit? Like, uh, I couldn't even imagine, right? But a year and a half later, I was ready to go for him. So under the water, I could, in my mind, now I had a machete. And now I could wield it and right, blood would be flying everywhere. And it was glorious. And I could, I could reenact this, not just to go faster, but I think it healed me very, very deeply. I think it calmed my mind down. I think it helped me feel much more in charge of my life. Um, I didn't have to scare anybody like the way I think I just did you too. <laughs> no way. I'm like, yes, I know what you mean. Machete. <laughs> like, okay. And it's like you did your own self-induced somatic therapy almost. Exactly. You know, I, I, I know I looking back, I think, yeah, that's exactly what I did is, um, yeah, that, that I had a place to be able to really let go and still like not lose community, right? If you, if you try to do that um, without a safe space around you, like people are gonna <laughs> say goodbye, you know, they're, you're, you're um, and so anyway, I kind of figured it out for myself, like how to have that, how to do that. Um, like now my husband does that. If I'm really upset about something, my husband can totally be, and I said, like, I, my question to him is always, can you be my catcher's mitt, mm. right? So don't try to fix me, don't try to, right? I, but I need to get it out. And there is something about like, you know, hoo, hoo, like going for it, right? Like, don't hold back. Like, if anything, overdo it. And it just, for some reason, like, it calms me. Yes. Again, not a therapist, I'm a lawyer, but... Uh, I can just, I can only tell you like what has worked for me to be able to uh, calm that part of myself. 
And in conjunction with regular therapy and regular, I mean, it sounds like you hit it from every angle. Well, I don't get personally. Now, remember, this is just one person. I have not gotten that much out of regular therapy. That's not what has been like the big healer for me. Um, what works for me is um, um, there's a place called Shalom Mountain um, and uh, like it, um, it, it, it does give you a container to be able to um, express whatever's in there. There's wisdom and emotion, being able to go into it instead of being afraid of, oh, you know, I don't want to feel that fear or I don't want to feel that anger or that sadness. Um, so instead of going, um, instead of going away from whatever you don't want to feel, but having a place to be able to go towards it. So, um, and then meditation and prayer has been key for me to really, um, you know, I'm, I meditated this morning. I meditate all the time. Um, but just to get in touch with really what's to, with me, with what's important to calm my mom, my mind down, um, it is, you know, as somebody who works now in the field of sexual abuse and listening to stories on the phone all the time, I've got to take care of me and, um, you know, and I'm naturally empathetic and I naturally want to, you know, put my arms around my client even, even, even before COVID. Um, and uh, um, so, um, but I have to, uh, I've just got to figure out ways of making sure that I'm okay to be able to do it. I love that. I think there's so much yeah, wisdom in that. That's exactly what you mean. Yeah. And I mean, even as Neo and I have been reporting podcasts, I mean, sometimes we have a few a day and by the end of the day, I'm just like, that's it. Like, I can't do anymore. Like, I'm turning on Netflix. I'm watching something that has absolutely zero emotion involved that I can just go to sleep with afterwards and not I, like I, replay all the conversations I had today. Yeah. 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 And so, I've actually started meditating because oh, I don't have jujitsu. Uh, I mean, I have jujitsu, but not in the sense that I really was using it for coping and personal therapy. So I've just been, and like the work we've been doing with the foundation, like she said, it just really has brought up a lot. And so finally I was like, all right, I'm going to try it. <laughs> Let's try meditation. Like the science is behind it. Science and, is there. Right. Yeah. But also, yeah, Elizabeth, not just not just doing uh, television or something that numbs you out, but actually, so I would say as your coach is exercise, go for a hard run, a hard bike ride. Oh, but I do. Yeah, she does. Do you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We all speak the same language. Same. Well. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I that whole I'm the mind, body, this. spirit thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm the only one in this conversation who has never been a uh, like a, a world champion athlete. <laughs> oh, I'm nowhere near Neo, Nancy's level. <laughs> well, no, but Mio, she is her for her weight. She is a world champion in jujitsu. So um, she definitely. I know. I, know. Like I actually, pretty, yeah, pretty I, awesome. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, I ran five miles today. I feel pretty good. <laughs> that, that is great. Yeah. But no, I mean, when I saw like who was doing this with you, Elizabeth, I was like, right on, you know. And right away, I wanted to introduce her to like my peeps, you know, who are also doing this work and who also are, you know, uh, into particularly those that are in, you know, I was not in a sport that was a, uh, like a wrestling or jujitsu or karate or taekwondo. I was not in a combat type sport, but the people who do that, like they, they kind of like with, with Mayo, like they have a, um, there's like a language and there's a, um, there's a camaraderie and there's a, a certain way of being in the world that I deeply admire. Well, and from my feeling from today, you've got it. <laughs> Whether or not you've got the combat experience, you've got that commonality. Yeah. And one of the things that I just love listening to you, your story and where you are now and what you're doing, um, one of our previous podcast guests, um, amazing Jolene, um, she, one of my favorite quotes from that podcast was that she put purpose to her pain. And I mm. feel like a lot of victims and survivors and um, advocates have done just that. And like, I'm so impressed with how you've gone on 
and you've put such purpose behind the pain that you've been through and you are now this amazing lawyer that is helping manage and navigate this very, very tricky world of coaching and athletes and abuse and scandals and cover-ups. And I mean, I, we're going to need to have you back on to specifically talk about Title IX. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because yeah. I feel like that is such an important um, topic, but I'm, I've just been enthralled with you. <laughs> So, oh, thank you. Thank so you. So glad you've come on today. <laughs> and I know we don't have tons of time left on today's episode, so we definitely want you back. But I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about this, um, what you've created in the last five years. This is Champion Women. women champion Champion yeah. Women. Champion Women. Yeah. So Champion Women. Um, I looked at my the my career. I'm 58 years old, and I guess at the time, I guess I was like 52, and thought like you know, um, if I was, a, it was, if I was just in private practice and I was representing clients, how far could I take it? How much change could I actually get there in the world? And I decided intentionally that I would instead, uh, work for change, uh, as from a systems perspective, right? So we're working to, um, change some of the governance that goes on. One of the, one of the main things that we're working on right now is, um, changes to the Olympic movement. Now I know that both of you probably think that you're not part of the Olympic movement, but my guess is you probably are and your children are. So the Olympic movement is not 800 athletes once every four years. It is 16 million athletes. It is sport that is not associated with schools. Okay, so when your kids go to soccer right down the street, they're probably a U.S. soccer program or one of their one of their derivations, one of the lower levels. Um, almost all swim clubs belong to United States swimming. It's where they get their insurance and whatnot. So right, so this is when you think of sport that is not associated with a school. Okay, so you're not playing varsity gymnastics or right. You said you're at a club gymnastics. And in that system, uh, I've been teaching sports law now for 20 years. And in 20 years, I've had fewer than five of my students who are very interested in the governance of sport even know that the Olympic movement, the 16 million athletes, was covered by a statute. It's called the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. And it governs like, you know, governance, right? Who, who determines how this happened, right? Um, what the Olympic movement was doing was um, it was um, uh, uh, it was trying to say that sexual abuse is not its problem, that this is the police problem, it's a parent's problem, it's a children family services problem, but the Olympic movement, that it was not, that they, they knew, they knew, they knew, they knew that little kids were being sexually abused and they didn't think that they should do anything about it. It was an intentional decision on their part. I say that if athletes had been part of the governance structure, that we would have funded what is now, we call the United States Center for Safe Sport. This is where they do the education on abuse. This is where they um, take it a complaint, do an investigation, and then the sanction in the US Center for Safe Sport is to get that coach away from kids. So. Um, we know how few rapists or child molesters actually go to prison. The criminal justice system just is not that great at being able to protect kids. So we have to have other layers of other systems of being able to handle it. So um, uh, we have a website right now that if anybody could go on to uh, um, usopu.info, usopu.info. And we, we, we've already had, we already have about 300 Olympians and Paralympians and very elite athletes who have signed on. Um, but we just need like the public to, to, to understand how this statute is going to affect their children. Um, I've been trying to get this idea across to uh, throughout sport is um, the, the demarcation between coaching and uh, romantic partners. Um, that, that blurriness, any blurriness in there is poses this real 
risk of damage out there to kids. Um, my coach, uh, my last coach, I had phenomenal coaching. My last coach, not quite so much, Mitch Ivey, is now on the banned list. He was molesting my teammate at the time that I was with him. Um, because she was 16 years old and she was six feet tall and um, she didn't look like a little kid. She didn't look tiny, somebody that you would feel sorry for. She looked like an adult. And a lot of, you know, 12, 14 year olds, they do, but they are children. They need to be protected as children. So um, um, his, the, the way it was language to us was that they were dating, that they were having a relationship. And so if there's one thing, if I could get it across to all sports governing bodies, is just this, uh, the boundaries that are so important between coaches and athletes. Um, coaches shall not have romantic and sexual relationships with the athletes they coach, regardless of age or consent. So a 25-year-old athlete is just as protected as a 25-year-old actress that is trying to get into a movie. A 25-year-old um, athlete is just as protected as an employee at a business whose boss is making their hiring and firing decisions. Um, and because there has been a lot of marriages uh, in there, it validates when the, when the 12 year old is kissed, she doesn't get sort of the, how harmful that is. She just thinks she frankly, a lot of times, you know, these, you know, she thinks she's in love. She's been groomed by not having any boundaries around her sports experience so that um, she's, you know, has now become part of it. Um, so, yeah, if we could, if, if, if sport could just institute this hard line um, thing, if you go onto our website, we've got a one pager that, that sort of lays out in all simplicity uh, you don't have to read 80 pages, but if you know what the boundaries are, coaches won't be alone with their athletes, that they won't send a text individually, that they'll always include the parents, that they won't be friends with them on social media. Um, I mean, we actually have to say you won't, they won't room together, but they won't uh, fat shame. Um, they won't um, uh, throw equipment or belittle and degrade because all of those things, it takes that environment for a kid not to be able to say no. So, right, you have to think of like, how can we make sure that the, the participants in here um, don't have to be so obedient and compliant? Because if they have to be obedient and compliant, uh, you're setting them up for abuse. Um, they have to give them a strong no. I think actually in one of my, one of my first uh, comments onto your Facebook page, which I really love, I really love all the podcasts that you all get to do, is I said, um, you know, I, what I tell my kids is you have my permission to be rude. When somebody violates a boundary of yours, you have my permission to be rude. You can, you can validate yourself. And no, you, we don't, and you don't need to worry about their feelings or their concerns. I want you to be concerned with you the same way you know that I love you and I would see you through my eyes. I would take care of you. I want you to do that for you. Um, so those are, uh, those are just some ways both culturally with trying to make sure that coaches don't end up abusing athletes, but also legally making sure that athletes have a remedy to be able to get the out, get the coach out. Wow. Well, thank you so much. It looks like we are out of time today. So to everyone watching, I mean, some of the things that I walked away from today's conversation with, I mean, first off, how amazing is Nancy? I mean, how <laughs> incredible is she? And what, I mean, I know we didn't even talk about this, but what an inspiration she is for all of us um, in, in any walk of life and whatever struggle we're facing. I mean, not even if you're just a sexual assault survivor, um, but whatever struggle you are. I mean, struggle is a part of life and how inspiring to see this beautiful example right in front of us, Nancy, who Aww. went on to not just dominate her Olympic field, but has gone on and become such a powerful advocate for women and survivors and victims and 
and what an inspiration that is. And that's just proof that we, each one of us, we can do that. I mean, we may not share the exact same stage or the exact same platform, but what an example of hope and truth for all of us. And then also like me, um, you may never go on to be an Olympic athlete. However, (laughs) from our little bit at the end, come to find out we all are actually probably, if not directly involved in uh, the world of of Olympia, Olympics, um, we are closely connected to it. And this is an issue that we should all care about because yeah, you know what? Um, My, my daughter, she's, five she's young she's little um but she already has been on her little soccer team and I know my little boy will when he gets a little bit older I know my baby girl will and whether it's soccer or any other sport if it's a club sport that is part that is if I'm wording it correctly and you you tell me if I'm wrong but that is that is part of part of the movement it's regulated Mm -hmm. by by the Olympic movement. There we go. And so this is something we should all be doing. So just to repeat what Nancy said, I mean, go to O-U-S-A. Sorry, say it again, Nancy. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for asking. USOPU.info. USOPU.info. Yeah, it stands for United States Olympians. Yeah, United States Olympians and Paralympians Unbroken.info. I-N-F-O. And then you're also championwomen.org, right? Yeah, champion. Yeah, all one word, championwomen.org. Dot org. Okay. Yeah, we've got some really great resources up there. Um, but I, I, I just want to say, I always like er, kind of cringe a little bit when somebody says, oh, isn't that great that you were raped and then you went on to win the Olympics? The reason why I was able to do it is something that everybody who's watching and ev- the whole community can do is because people helped me, because they believed me and they believed how – how damaged I was at the time. Um, they, they gave me a ton of help. And so that's why I, we as human beings, what we can overcome if we are in a crucible of love, what we can do if people love them through their healing. Um, everybody should get that. And um, I think we'd have a lot less damage if, um, if people got that. Yeah. So Amen. that's my that's, Amen. Yeah. Preaching yeah, to the choir there. Yeah, and yeah. um I mean just just repeating what Nancy said. I mean, every victim, every survivor deserves to be loved. Every victim deserves that support. I mean, as Nancy just said, that's what helped her go into the Olympics. That's what helped her to get to where she is. That's what helped me to get to where I am. If I didn't have the support, if I didn't have the love that I had, I definitely would not be here. I definitely would not have the courage to go back and even listen to other people's stories because I would be so caught up in my own. I couldn't do it. And I know that I come from an amazing community, a wonderful supportive family and every victim and survivor deserves that. And I mean, we are as, as humanity, you know, we we've seen, we've seen a lot of sides of humanity recently, but I know that we are all better than that. And this is an issue that, that affects, all of us. It's not just a women's issue. It's not just a men's issue. It's everyone's issue. So let's pull together and let's really try to do our best to support each other so that this doesn't happen anymore. Good. So with that being said, if you can, if you can love the unlovable, because at the time I was not that gracious or appreciative, it's only in hindsight. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, no, people can love the unlovable. Um, and see trauma instead of seeing like that's the person or that's a flaw in that person. Um, yeah, Elizabeth, I think you're just, you're a, um, you know, a beacon for that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. And yeah. thank you to everyone for tuning in today. We look forward to seeing you next time on our next episode of smart talks. Thank you. Bye-bye.